The turmoil in Egypt continues. What's next? Will its future look much like its past? Hello, I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. It's been nearly three years since a movement that came to be known as the Arab Spring spread across a number of countries in the Middle East. Protesters took to the streets demanding social, economic and political reform. In Egypt, thousands of civilians gathered in Cairo's Tahrir Square demanding the ouster of President Hosni Mubarak. After ruling the country for almost three decades, a defiant Mubarak finally agreed to step down. Months later, Egypt held its first democratic election. To the surprise of Western countries, Mohamed Morsi, a member of the Islamic Muslim Brotherhood, emerged the winner. Morsi won widespread support, promising to form a government that served all Egyptians. But as unemployment continued and food remained in short supply, he came under sharp criticism for mishandling the economy, granting himself unlimited powers and attempting to change Egypt's constitution. Critics called it an Islamic coup. By November 2012, protesters once again took to Tahrir Square, this time demanding Morsi's ouster. The protests escalated. On July 1, 2013, Egypt's military gave Morsi a 48-hour ultimatum, appease the people or be removed. Saying the military lacked the constitutional authority to remove him, Morsi refused. Two days later, in a bloodless coup, Egypt's first democratically elected president was arrested, the constitution suspended, and the government dissolved. With the military now firmly in control, clashes with pro-Morsi supporters occur daily. Just weeks ago, a terrorist bombing ripped through Cairo, both sides blaming the other. As casualties mount, a military that was once the iron fist of Mubarak's government is tightening its grip on power. Its charismatic leader, Field Marshal Abdul al-Sisi, is expected to announce his candidacy for president in April's upcoming election. Later, we'll talk with a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and a former Pentagon official, but we begin with noted Egyptian author, activist, and political commentator, Adaf Suef. Uh, thank you so much for joining us from London. I know you're a writer, so you take people on a journey with your words, so I'm going to ask you to frame Egypt not as an event, but as a story. And, and let me kind of give you the ingredients. Uh, it begins with uh, Tahrir Square, just chock full of people, all teeming with enthusiasm, optimism, really feeling the change is just around the corner. And I've heard you say that the Muslim Brotherhood came to the power on the backs of these protesters, and then once in power, turned their backs on them. So is this really a modern day Shakespearean tragedy? <laughs> Well, I hope not, because we're nowhere near the end yet. We are in a process, and um, it's, it's a difficult process, and nobody knows quite how many chapters there are in it. But um, one could say that we are, at the moment, um, entering Chapter 4. Chapter 4, okay. Well, there's a lot more chapters to come. I, I saw a recent piece by you in The Guardian where you said the ballot box is one component in a democracy. We have none of the others. What's missing? For a democracy, I think, to, to really work, you have to have genuine choices, that's one thing, and you have to have an informed public. And in order to have that, you have to have um, an honest media. Um, and so at the moment, we really don't have any of these. Um, the media is uh, very much singing from, from one uh, song sheet, um, and no other structures are in place. I mean, people. There is no um, like real proper way to, to, to get information about what is really happening. There are no programs out there that people can choose between. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I, there, there, is, there are no structures for a true democracy, even though that really is what people want. I mean, that is the huge appetite of the country, as we saw in January 2011. So if the ballot box is all there is, what goals were met with the revolution, would you say? Um, actually, I don't think that any of the goals of the revolution have been met. I think that uh, the revolution happened, but the revolution failed to take 
power at all. If you remember, we're talking in terms of a story, that there were the 18 glorious days and then the military, um, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, SCAF, took control. And the idea was, what they declared was that they would see the country through the process of transition to democracy. But in fact, they fought the revolution. They fought it every step of the way. Um, and they killed people and they arrested people and they, uh, you know, b placed all sorts of hurdles in the way of any real transition to a form of government that would give the people what they wanted. Um, eventually we did have elections and we did elect the Muslim Brotherhood because they were the only, um, the only political force that was organized and that was able to run a campaign and that was there on the ground and so they were elected um, and they proceeded Dr. Mohammed Morsi proceeded to behave as though he was simply inheriting the um, the power of Mubarak um, in terms of the economy in terms of uh, the abuses of human rights it was a completely um, anti everything that the revolution stood for and um, and then and then he was deposed and so um, basically if you remember that the aims of the revolution were essentially the economy social justice and human rights um, I think that a lot of us would say that human rights is worse now in Egypt than it was even during Mubarak's time um, that the economy is not in a good place and that it doesn't look as if we are about to get a government that is going to put the country on the road towards social justice. Well, well they always say uh, hindsight's 2020. What were the mistakes made during the re revolution? I mean, if, if, if we could replay this game, how might things be changed so that we'd have a changed outcome? I have been thinking, I mean, all of us obviously have been thinking about this a lot, and it's very hard to see what the people could do different or what the you know the young people who are known as the revolutionaries could could do different um, the people went out in this sort of you know exemplary fashion um, mostly nonviolent but there was a bit of violence but it didn't kill people it targeted um, police stations where people used to be tortured and so on um, and you know, stayed on the streets and made their demands very clear. Um, and the revolutionaries, or the young people, taken by surprise as everybody was, ran around trying to, um, you know, keep, keep the streets and the squares together, trying to take this process further. Now, the only place it could go further was actually to take power. And you can't have a million people taking power. They have to have representatives. And since this was such a sudden and surprising event, the only possible representatives that people could come up with really were the, the people who had, um, for a long time, played the role of opposition to the Mubarak government. In other words, the, the political elite, whether the secular, the leftists, the liberals, the brotherhood, and the activists approached them and tried to work with them and begged them really to um, to basically present a united front in front of the military and say we can form a civilian government this is what it would look like and the military can step back and if they had done that if the political elite of the country had done that um, very very early on in February 2011 they would have had the backing of the street and the country and the world, and it could have been done. Um, they failed to do that. They uh, could not agree among themselves. They uh, opened channels and responded to invitations from the military. And essentially, they really did not did not negotiate, I think, ultimately on behalf of the revolution. So it was and a, they certainly failed it, to it take was, power on behalf of the revolution. It, it was a lost opportunity, no doubt about it. Now, I think your nephew, I believe, is a cautionary tale about Egypt uh, because you've written about him. And you say he's either been imprisoned or charged by every regime that's governed Egypt during his lifetime. What does that say about him? What does it say about Egypt? What does it say about the revolution? 
it says that Egypt is in dire need of a change of system um, and that the young people who have been in opposition who have always really demanded the same things they have demanded um, an accountable government they have demanded transparency non-corruption and an economy and a system of running the economy that gives the majority of people um, a fair chance in life education health care just really standard things and Hale, my nephew, is one of those people, uh, first arrested in 2006, and then again and again. And as we speak now, he is in a high security jail in uh, Cairo. Um, we understand that he is being charged with criminal charges, but we can't get a, a trial date. We can't get a district uh, court. The lawyers can't even get a copy of the file of, of his case, and he's not alone. Um, in the supposedly celebrations of the 25th of January, the third anniversary of the revolution, we had um, more than 1,300 young people arrested. So um, basically, activists who have unchangingly taken a line that is progressive and that is pro the people and pro democracy and transparency have been locked up by Mubarak, by the military council, by Mohamed Morsi, and now again by the military and the supposedly civilian uh, interim government that we have. And I think that tells you a great deal about the situation. Well, and you know that, uh, he, he, as you said, he's not alone. And of course, you also know as a writer and a journalist, uh, there are 20 journalists in jail right now. I want to get your thoughts on that. I think a few days ago we were counting up to 60, but I'm not positive. But of course, yes, uh, there's uh, the Al Jazeera guys, there are a lot of Egyptians, there's Abdullah Shami, a young um, journalist and photographer, there are a lot of them. And it is a very unpleasant climate now for journalists uh, because basically, as I said earlier, the media now is required to sing out of one song sheet. And anybody who um, really describes what is happening or critiques it is immediately accused of either um, being in the pay of uh, some foreign power or in some way acting to discredit Egypt and they even talk about sort of destroying Egypt it, it's really quite remarkable um, I would say it borders on the hysterical on the one hand there is this huge um, rhetoric about how important we are and how great we are and on the other hand it's this fragility and how everybody's against us and you know nobody's allowed to say a single word and what I hear is that what is being said in the top circles of um, military and government is don't talk to us about um, universal rights about freedom of expression we're fighting a war on terror and we're not going to we you know there's no time for for any of that and that is extremely dangerous and troubling. We've only got about a minute left and I have to ask you this. Uh, LCC now, people talking about him as perhaps the next leader of this country. Uh, you know Nasser, Sadat, Mubarak have all been there. Um, is, after all this treasure lost, all this blood spilled, is the future of Egypt looking more and more like its past with another military leader taking over the helm? It's probably looking worse than its past because when Nasser, yes, was a military man, but he was uh, his project was a project that was for the good of the country. So his methods, military and so on, but in fact, he um, left the country economically and particularly the majority of the people who were poor in a much better situation than he found them. Um, at the moment, what we have is a crony capitalism. And if that is also married to a military style government, then that is not, not good news. Well, it is chapter four, as you said. Hopefully, there are more chapters to be written, and many more of them will be more pleasant. Adaf uh, Suaf, thank you so much. When we come back, two views on Egypt's future. We'll talk with a former assistant to the Deputy Secretary of Defense and a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. We're coming right back. <laughs>